So many. Uh, today we've come to do a talk for wielding SSH. So before we get started, uh, how many guys don't know what SSH is? So to, to, to save this time to kill you, to kill you and I assume none. So that's, so that's the, current, the current scope for this talk. Uh, we're going to do an interesting look into SSH itself. We pretty much just use it on the terminal uh, as a either server side or client side. We don't do much about anything past SSH itself, to run commands and do stuff. Um, there's going to be some Golang code here, but I need to emphasize it's not important that you understand the code itself, more like you get the high level concepts. Because you could do this in anything else. Uh, the guys who favor Rust, I've seen Ruby has libs for this as well, but today I'll just showcase the Golang one. So hopefully you can see tangible impacts of this. Uh, I'll talk about how SSH looks like from protocol level on a high level and showcase some of what Golang's like lib can do in terms of dealing with SSH itself. <coughs> and then we'll get to some other interesting stuff at the end. So first, uh, SSH is actually a protocol, contrary to what I thought before. It's just a command and a client and a server. It's a fully fledged protocol with four RFCs, surprisingly enough. If, I'm not sure there's anything else that has just one system that has as many RFCs. I may be wrong, I don't know. HTTP has like three. Um, the one we are, we are mostly uh, used to is OpenSSH. That's the thing you install on the client side and install on the server side and SSH with. Guys who've worked with Windows have probably touched PuTTY or PuTTY, how do you pronounce it? PuTTY. PuTTY. Yes, uh, and today I'll talk about the, lib, the Golang's lib that actually does this. Curiously enough, uh, Golang has a whole bunch of libs under an X directory, which are supposed to mean experimental. And then they've ended up becoming quite useful libraries. So at this point, people ask you, why the X? This code is 10 years old. It's got started written in 2012. So first, on a high level, SSH looks like this. Who remembers OSI layer stuff, where we go from physical all the way to session stuff and applications. So imagine we've just reached the TCP layer. On top of the TCP layer is an extra transport layer that SSH adds in. It's called the SSH transport layer. It's the, it's the 42 words. And all this does is takes care of two particular things. Host authentication. Are you really talking to the guy you're expecting to be talking to? I think everyone's seen this way when you're SSH and you ask, you ask, are you sure you want to log into this particular server? I think I can showcase that in a bit here. Let me see if I can enter any one of I know the server that I'm going to. Some of our office servers. You see that? Yeah. That's source of education. That's asking you to prove whether you really trust the place you're going to. So that's what that does. And the second thing it does, it's responsive for the encryption and packaging and putting on everything else that's at the lowest level of SSH. Then immediately on top of that, after the connection is, is basically decided, the host actually, once you authenticate to the host, the host actually sees. These are the algorithms I have, and these are the algorithms I support for encryption. Choose the ones you want, and you can start discussing stuff. So once that particular secure connection is done, we get to the user authentication stage. Now this is where the client basically says, I am so and so, authenticating this password or this public key, find out if it's true or not. That's, that's where that is done. Then finally, after all this is done, a full-fledged connection is now made for SSH, which turns out to be a very interesting beast. On a high level, the SSH connection is actually a multiplex stream of different channels. So, typically when you use SSH, you only use, most of the time, you only use just one channel. But you can have as many channels running at the same time for an SSH session. It's a very interesting thing. It means you can do all kinds of interesting stuff. This is how you can actually do dynamic forwarding while still logged into a server and doing other things. So if you make a tunnel, SSH tunnel, or you do some other interesting things with SSH and you've logged in, that same same connection is then used for all those tunnels because it has extra channels. And then one crazier thing that they added to the protocol is that every channel and the parent connection itself have out of band request uh, channels, if I can call them that. So think of this think of this entire thing like this. Think of the SSH connection as a highway with infinite lanes. Of course, there's no such thing as infinite lanes in 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 you know what, in hardware and software. Yeah? No free lunch. But imagine it as so. It's, it's a highway with infinite lanes. Then those lanes each have service lanes. That's, that's, that's how the analogy works out. 
And so while you're having a particular connection doing specific things on a server, there's out of band messages going through there. For example, whenever you change your screen, basically your screen size, there's an out of band request telling the terminal at the other end the screen size has changed. Or for example, if you have a really weird setup where the speed of your terminal is different from the servers, if it suddenly slows down, there's out of band requests adjusting for that. And so you have very interesting effects where you look at HTOP and you change the size of the window and you see HTOP has adjusted. That's already negotiated via the SSH connection. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment an, the actual, an example of how that actually looks like when you're logging OpenSSH itself. The cool thing about this side lanes, I'm talking about these requests, is that they're dual, they're two way. The client can send requests to the server and the server can send requests to the client. I've seen rare implementations of server to client requests, but it's possible. Most of them are client to server. So let me show you a demonstration of what I mean by, I think I have, I have my name, my title, I think I can do this, yeah. Guest at localhost. I've set up a user on my machine called guest, who's logged in with a silly password. But what I want us to see is the actual activity when you're making a, a message connection. The five Bs are just to get us to the lowest level of logging or verbosity. So I want to show you, immediately after we started, the first few things that are being done here ta -da -da -da, is aside from the client basically trying to figure out if I have keys or not, the moment it is a point where it connects to the server, here it is. So the TCP connection is established at a very early point in time. So that's already done. And then we get basically a coordination of what type of uh, client I am. Then you get this message here. This basically tells, the client tells the server, um, let's instantiate a key exchange uh, process. This is where the server comes in and tells, them, it tells us the client, these are all the algorithms I support right now to be able to communicate with you, to share keys and, and encrypt the, the, the connection. Also interesting enough, they also discuss which compression algorithm to use and so forth. After that is all said and done, Actually, I should have shown you the, da, 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 da. yeah. There's a point where it tries to prove the server is really it. It's interspersed between other logs. Let's see if I can find the next one. Yeah. So it was trying to, to prove the server, but I've disabled that for localhost. There's no point in proving my localhost is true. But as you can see, the thing that you should be keen on is this debug three particular log level. This is where the actual integrity protocol negotiations actually revealed. But let me just log in so we can see the rest. Mm -hmm. Oh, my key is active. Okay, that's interesting. Let's ignore all that and follow from the past phrase. You'll notice immediately after the authentication succeeded, this, see that? Channel zero was opened. So the client requests, let's debug this step, the client requests for channel to be opened to perform this particular session process. Uh, and then interesting enough, OpenSSH has its own out of band request it does between OpenSSH client and OpenSSH server. This isn't part of the SSH protocol, it's part of OpenSSH implementation. So you see stuff like this. And then interesting enough, the ones I want to really, really show you are this one. Am I going up or down? Oh, here it is. See that and that. These two out of band requests, they used to basically set up the terminal on the other end. They basically say, give me a terminal that looks like this, and this is the shell I want you to run, and so forth. So these two are what basically set up your, your, your shell, and once they've been confirmed, CPQI allocation request accepted, you get a shell. So that's the entire process of how an SSH connection is negotiated. On the highest level, it pretty much just looks like this. You have multiple channels. So interesting enough, if you're doing tunneling, you'd see another channel, like channel one, doing the tunnel stuff. If you're doing multiple ports, you'd see channel two doing the other, the other port, and so forth. And then these requests are basically coordinating various things between the client and the server. Are they timing me? Yes, sir. You're timing me. Um, 
How about this? this? Okay. Actually, I have a slide. The, so Ed's asking if uh, Bash runs as a daemon receiving commands from the client side to run stuff. Actually, I have a whole slide on how that entire sequence goes on. I was just highlighting it here from the OpenSSH side, but I'll show you on a step-by-step -step, uh, level. Um, but it's an interesting question. I want to show you how that actually works out. On the client side, the, or when you're using this library or basically using any library related to SSH, the flow is pretty much straightforward. You start by connecting the server socket, port 22 or whatever port it is. Once TCP is established, you prove the server is the one you expect. Now in most cases, people don't do this. That's the reason why when it asks, you just say yes. Don't actually prove that the host that you're seeing is. So there's opportunities for MIT aiming, but it's very rare. Then finally, after you do that, you do a credentials handshake. You say, there's a whole RFC there's a whole, I'll, I'll get back to you. There's a whole RFC discussing how authentication works on SSH. I'll not go into that here today because that is an entire interesting uh, whole section. But we'll do that in another day. But today, for, for today, let's assume we're just working with the ones we know. Password, public key, agents. And quite rarely, who has ever used the keyboard interactive challenge authentication method? Yes, there's such an authentication method. SSH is interesting. After that is said and done, an SSH connection is established. Once the connection is established, you enter into this interesting world now where you have to manage all of the channels and the requests and so forth. So at that point, you're free to do whatever you like. If you have a server on the other end talking a protocol you know, like for example, SSH talking to a SSH server, you can do whatever you want. You can set up things in however process you want. For example, if you have a client that's talking to a server that you've configured in a specific way, you can pull off some very wicked things. Some of the examples I'll show you at the end, someone wrote chat with SSH and someone wrote Tron with SSH. The, the protocol is open for you to do whatever you want with it. The one we currently use open SSH is mostly used for us to do tunnels, to do shells, to run commands. On the server side, it's pretty much also the same. Is you, accept, you listen on a socket, you accept client connections. Now in this particular case, server doesn't, the server doesn't um, authenticate the client. The client, by sending their credentials, are authenticating themselves to the server. And now they do that credentials handshake. And finally, a connection is established. And the same opposite thing happens on the other end, on the server end. So interesting enough, both the client and server are doing connection handling in the same process. The crazy thing, you remember when I talk about channels? Everyone is capable of opening channels and using them. The client can open channels directed towards the server and basically coordinating data like that. And the server can open channels in the reverse order and communicate in that way. So you can actually write full diamonds talking SSH between each other. So you can do interesting stuff because the protocol allows it. Now, connection handling is kind of a bit wicked. I just need you guys to understand on a high level what it is. The low level stuff, especially when it comes to Golang, requires a lot of understanding of Golang concurrency, channels, coroutines, and so forth. But on a high level, essentially what happens is on both sides, they can make global requests for things. They can say, um, I want this to happen. And if the other side understands what that request is for, it can interpret it. And so you could make interesting things. You could make, the one of the, I think, the best examples I can give for global requests is tunnels are done on global requests, where you say, please open a port on your side. Uh, so if you're doing remote port forwarding, you're saying, I want to port forward a port on this local side to another port on that other side. The client basically tells the server, open a port 10,000, and then whenever traffic enters there, redirect it to me on this channel. And then when the traffic comes to the client's channel, it redirects it to the local port. That's essentially what a tunnel is from the SSH point of view. And the other side as well. So those are those global requests are used to mediate that particular thing. Um, and aside from the global requests, you can now start opening channels, sending data over the channels on both sides, and handling the requests within the channels as well. Because, for example, for session channels, the ones that deal with commands and, and shells, you, as we have already seen, they send specific requests to each other to set up things. I forgot to show you guys something something cooler. We're still here. We're still logging. Let me change the window size. Notice this. There's a, there's a request telling the other side, my window size is changing, adjust to me as well. 
and so forth if I do if I, if I go back, which is very cool. Now let me scare you a bit with Go code. We have here basically the the simplest version you could write for a client on the GoLang lib. It provides for high-level APIs for you to do things. Those things I'm talking about. This session object you see here is a very powerful abstraction around that stuff. So you can use it freely without having to worry about who, who's running on which channel and which request am I supposed to be receiving. And I'll show you an example of how a client code can set up a whole terminal on the GoLang side. However, if you want to go a bit crazier, there's lower level stuff where you get the full access to the connection itself, the channels and the requests and everything else. And so you can manage them on your own if you wanted to. But in a nutshell, as you can see, it's pretty much configure the connection, connect to CP. Although in this case, the abstraction for the higher level stuff is it does the two at the same time. But for the lower level stuff, you have to connect TCP first, then authenticate the connection. Now authorization from the Golang lib is pretty much uh, whatever you like. Bring, bring your own uh, fancy stuff. Uh, you have the password, which is straightforward. Then you have a password callback, which I really like, because this means you could retrieve your passwords from anywhere. You are limited in whatever technique you want to retrieve your passwords from. You want to ask the user, you want to retrieve it from a database, you want to retrieve it from a file, go over the net, if you're crazy enough. Same case with keys. You can provide the keys directly, or have a callback to decide how the keys are, de are determined. Finally, we have the thing that authenticates the host, which is basically the same. You, have, you don't really care about the authentication. You use a specific key, which is a server's key, or you have a callback to do that for you. So imagine if you had a software that basically raised hosts very frequently. And so you, host keys were generated on the fly. You'd have stuff on the callback to basically retrieve the keys to authenticate your clients. And then we have the very awesome SSH agent, which is pretty straightforward if you look at it, to use. You just get the keys from the agent and you're done, and you authenticate, and you're, you're, you're fine, you're good to go. I'll demo all these things, this is actually here. I'll demo all these things just to show you that I'm not talking out of uh, my own stuff. So let's see. Let's start with the SSH password uh, demo. Password. So in this particular case, uh, let me show you the code base a bit. So in this particular case, I'm logging in. This is the password for the guest user here. I'm logging into the guest user locally here. I'm ignoring host checking. And once the session is started, I'll talk about this terminal stuff later. I start a terminal on it. And so if I'm proven right, and the demo goes are happy, I have a, I have a terminal on. This is all mediated by Go. And cool enough, it handles everything, even window changes. This took me a while to get, right, get it right for this talk. Uh, I'll talk about that in a later point. Uh, terminals are quite interesting. And so I can log out. I have a bug though. Notice I haven't actually exited the terminal after logging out. So that's another, that's the caveat I added. That this is not prod ready. You need to do some extra work like error checking and so forth to handle stuff like this. But if I press an enter, I'm back to where I was. It's just a bug in handling the termination. So that was password. Let's have a look at public key. What my, my, my intention is just tempt you to be able to come and do interesting things with this. As you can see, same, same stuff. Only difference is I'm using a public key. And then it starts a terminal. So to prove that, so that I don't, I don't feel like I'm, I'm doing one, one, particular, one particular thing and then saying all of them have the same bug. Don't mind that. Finally, we have this other interesting thing. Let's do the agent first. Right now, I don't have an agent active. So if I can run this, this should crap out. I have no error checking, That's, that explains the panic. If I had error checking, I would have been able to catch the fact that I have no SSH agent around. And the code is very straightforward. As you'll notice, I'm ignoring all the error checking everywhere. Otherwise, this code would be too long to be able to showcase properly. So in this example, I'm getting the socket, which is a Unix socket uh, for the SSH agent, retrieving the keys from it and connecting. So now, let me add my key. Uh, I don't know which key I used. I think I used test. Yeah. So if I try this instead, 
We're good. So that was agent. Uh, let me show you running commands. This is cool. So in this particular case, I'm not starting a terminal. I'm just running a command across the across the connection, and the command is date. So we should get the date back if I run this correctly. So you can imagine an application where you write something that basically pings all your servers and gets whether they are out of out of date or something of the sort. It's contrived, but it's a good example. And you can notice I'm still back in the the, the, the shell I was. I didn't make a terminal and log into the other side. I just logged in, got the date, got out. And this is all mediated by the go side. And I want to show you how cool this is. Once you open a session, it's pretty much I.O. So this is the stupidest code I wrote here. You, you basically redirect standard out and standard in to the, the appropriate channels, and that's it. You get the data back. Uh, next up, I want to show downloading and uploading files. Now, this is kind of hack, because I, I actually learned SCP, if you are to transfer files by SSH and assume you didn't have SCP, the cheekiest version of this is to basically, if you want to download, just cut the file to standard out. And then redirect the standard out to some file locally, and you are done. <laughs> That's the simplest way of doing SCP. For the download, for the upload, it's a bit more contrived. You're essentially telling cut on the other side to rewrite to a file there. The data will come from standard in from this side since cut works the same way. And so that's essentially what that code does. So essentially what you have is you've set up a channel between the server and you, yeah, right? Then you tell the server, if for the download, cut a file on the other side, but, but redirect it to standard out. But the standard out is connected to this channel. So all you need to do is on this other side, connect the standard out for this channel to a file locally, yeah? And the same thing for the, for the upload. Just tell the server on the other side, cut what I'm sending to you into a file on that side, and then send all the stuff on the standard in. Pretty straightforward. Find that very simple. Like I, I, I've, been, I've been thinking this stuff is uh, complicated, but it's surprisingly simple on the lowest level. So you'll see, I just ran a command here where I'm cutting the file I want to download to come to this local site. As you can see, once I'm done with getting the bytes, I just write them to the local file. Uh, I hope I remember what files I was actually working with. What was I working with? Oh, okay. Now, I know, if I remember correctly, there should be some files here. So I'm going to download test. So test just says hello world. So I'm going to download test. Um, we want the source file on that side called test, and we want to move it to, let me just prove there's nothing in TMP called test2. There's no test2. So what you're going to download test to TMP test2. So if I open TMP test two, hello world. Same case with the, with the upload. Now, the segue I want to put here is SCP actually works similarly. It's cheeky, it's not documented unless you look at the, at the actual source code, but SCP works in the same format. SCP runs a remote command on the other end to do basically what CAT does. And the same thing on this end to do what basically I'm doing with CAT. So it, it runs SCP in something called sync mode if it wants to save there, and it runs SCP in source mode if it wants to download. This is similar, it's just pretty much cut, cut. So let's do upload. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, I want to show you that all we're doing is opening a local file and sending its data over the standard in for that channel to the other side. And then the cut basically takes data from standard in and writes it to, to the file that you tell it to. So we are going to copy, happily enough, our TMP test two to test two on the other side. So if I SSH to now, it's test two, which has hello world. So I think that's the gamut for test for the client side. We'll come to the server side. I think I haven't missed anything out. So I also wanted to showcase that this library can do anything you want to do with it. And once you go to the low level stuff, it's pretty much anything you wish to do. So long as the client and server understand the same protocol they're talking about, you can do whatever you want. So I'm, learn, uh, I'm running OpenSSH server on the other side, but I'm running the client code all on Golang. So I, 
I have not configured anything. It's, it's my local SSHD running here. Yeah. So does the local implementation depend on the local version of SSH? No. The library is fully, fully fledged Golang. The, the beauty about the protocol is it's straightforward. If you actually look at the source code for the library, because that's, I learned a lot of things, tricks and hacks from the source code of the lib itself. It's all implemented in Go, because it's a matter of just sending packets over the line. Yeah. Ah, interesting point. Curiously enough, I found an interesting one. For example, there is, there is OpenSSH specifies ways to send, oh, the Golang list specifies ways to send signals to the other terminal. OpenSSH does not abide by those, by those ways. So for example, you could write uh, a client sending signals to the terminal on the other side, OpenSSH would just ignore you. So it's a matter of the two, the two client and server have to talk the same kind of higher level protocol. But the beauty about OpenSSH, it's so old, Nobody remembers any other implementation of SSH. So pretty much when people write clients, or people write compatible servers, they write them according to what OpenSSH is doing. Yeah. So server flow. Server flow is the same, same case. Very straightforward. You configure the server. Note the two callbacks. The beauty about the callbacks, and I have missed, I've actually, I'll talk about this later on a project I'm working on. The beauty about these two callbacks is you can do the authentication however you want. Password callback, public key callback. Fetch them from wherever you want. You want to fetch them from an authorization file. I'll show you this in a moment. You want to fetch them from uh, wherever you want to fetch them from. If you have a whole fleet of key value servers that are highly available that store your keys or you can basically use that as the basis of. Yeah, this one I mentioned Vault here. Yeah, I was to mention it much later, but yes. Vault's SSH engine is written in this library. Uh, and the connection handling. Now, at this point, I'll probably lose you because this, we're not getting into the deep, into the weeds we go now. But pretty much, global requirements here, or global recs, global requests, is a channel. And all we are doing is just ranging over that channel, going over that channel, receiving requests from the other end. This applies to every type of request. Even if it's a channel request, it's a global request. So long as you have the channel that has that stuff, you can just range over it and do stuff with it. Something cool that I learned about this entire library is you don't have to worry about typical problems with channels. Like for example, there's one adage that says if you start a go routine, you need to know how to stop it. And if you have a channel, you need to know when you're closing it. The beauty about this is when the connection goes down, all those channels will go down. So sometimes you don't have to worry about closing them. That's why I can do stuff like this. You don't have to do special case to concurrency stuff. So you want, you, you, you're you asking whether the, by ranging over the channel, you're keeping the connection alive. Hmm. Ah, so what's the implementation behind this particular? Okay, now remember the multiple layer protocols for SSH. Turns out the SSH transport is so good or at least so long as you're on a reliable stream, that you don't have to worry about guarantee, such guarantees at the highest level. At that point in time, all the implementation does is listen to a particular stream. If it can read from it, it has data. If it can't, it has no data. The, the, the transport layer is built in such a way that you can actually send a request and trust that it goes to the other end. So all you're doing ranging here is basically in the background, there's just a guy reading from a socket or from a file descriptor waiting for stuff to come out. The, if I'm not mistaken, I think the pipes are the lowest level, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I have two answers. So Ed is asking if SSH tries to reconnect when it loses the connection. I have two answers to that. First, it has to, it, SSH has to rely on something. So for example, in this case, it's lying on the TCP uh, transport. Mosh builds the SSH or SSH equivalent on UDP. And other people build basically, so long as you have a stream you trust, at the lowest level, you can build up SSH from there on. Now, the other extra point is SSH is odd. 
There is places where SSH does reconnect and I've never understood if it was SSH itself or some other intermediating factor. If you've ever used Tmax on a server, for some odd reason, if the connection goes down and comes back up, Tmax is still on and still works. And I've never understood why. I've, 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 I'll go and find that about, but sometimes it doesn't do that. It, unless the connection was really severely cut. If it's like a slow connection that goes down a bit and comes back. Typical SSH ch ch connections would fail. But when you have Tmax on, for some reason that still goes on. I have my suspicion is something to do with uh, the terminal speed, terminal baud rate, because the terminal is a serial device. If I think Tmax messes with some things there and allows you to pretend like you're still online and basically buffers the, the entire conversation until everything comes back on. But I don't know, I'm speculating at this point. Yeah. I'll talk about that because the terminal, terminal business is kind of interesting. And for channels, it's pretty much simple. You range over a channel, a Golang, a Golang channel, or a Go channel that has the SSH channels with it. So every single channel comes in, and you need to whether accept it or not. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm not accepting anything that is not a, a, session, a session channel. And that's, I think, what OpenSSH does. I don't know if OpenSSH supports, I'm not sure of the other extra channel types OpenSSH servers support, but session is the most famous, because it's what they use to run shells, commands, there could probably be a special channel for tunnels. Yes, there's probably a special uh, channel type for tunnels, but I can't remember what it was called. And channel itself on this other side is IO. You can read and write to it and do whatever you want. On the server side, yeah. So you could write your own SSH servers as you feel like and accept whatever protocols you feel like. You could write an SSH server that only does tunnels and that's it. You don't want to have anyone uh, connecting uh, shells to this. I think if I'm not mistaken, GitHub's, if you try to SSH to GitHub's SSH port and try to open it, it will refuse. That's pretty much how it's happening in the background. They're just refusing that channel. Yeah. So yes, so as I pointed out earlier, an SSH connection is pretty much unlimited multi-session. You could start whatever you want. You could start a, a shell here and another shell here on the same, same connection. I'll show you a server implementation that is multi-session after I'm done with this. So before we go to that server implementation, I want to give you a, a taste of how starting a shell on SSH looks like. It's a bit contrived. So first, after the connections have been established, first thing that happens is the client opens a session channel or requests for a session channel to be opened on the server side. And the server now basically decides, do I want to accept this channel or not? And because the session channel, as I showed before, it will accept it. Then secondly, the client sends, I want a pseudo terminal on that side. That's what PTY means. It's a pseudo TTY device. If you don't have to be familiar about this, but TTY devices are essentially the abstraction behind almost every single terminal we have today. The old terminals were basically teletypes. And so as we built better, better displays and better software and so forth, all we've done to support the old OSs is abstract our modern terminals against that particular uh, behavior. And so the client says, I want you to give me a terminal on the other end. And it specifies what kind of terminal emulator it wants. For example, uh, by default, OpenSSH uses the terminal that you're using in your current. Let me show you something interesting. Um, environment variables are pretty powerful. Uh, we're looking for term. Look at this. So this, this is what decides what terminal is started on the other end. It essentially just carries forward your terminal. These ways, I think, is an option to change it for SSH. I'm not sure. I think there's an option to change it. But from the li library, you can do whatever you want. Exactly. Have you ever had errors where the, the other side it says terminal not supported? That's, that's basically what that means. Yeah. I think what happens is for OpenSearch servers, I think they, they do a downgrade to a different terminal emulator if they don't have it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, after it's done requesting for a terminal, it asks for a shell to be started on it. Curiously, the current implementation for OpenSSH, the shell, you don't pass along what shell you want. The server decides what shell it will start for you. So as your user, the, the user you specified on your server, the shell you specified that you want is what will be used, not what you have on the client side. So if you have SH on the other side, that's why you can enter into a server and find you in an, in an SH shell. That's because on the other side, that's the shell, the default shell on that side. After those have been done, all you have to do now 
is essentially just wiring standard in to that channel and send it out to the same thing to your, to your screen. And that's it, you're done. You now have a terminal running on the other end. In a nutshell, essentially what it looks like is there's a terminal running here whose standard in is on your machine and whose standard out is on your machine. That's essentially what it's done, mediated by SSH. So typically on the server side, it just looks the same way. You accept the requests, do what the client is asking, and then wire in the terminal to that side, and you're done. So, oh. So let me go back a bit. How am I doing for time? Terrible. <laughs> I promised to do this in one hour, so I've already, I've already broken that promise. Um, so, in a nutshell, a terminal device, uh, let me go back to even the lower roots. Your machine here, pretty much standardizes, Linux standardizes all your input and output into the following things. You have a terminal, and you have a keyboard, or your input devices. Input devices are wired in into standard in, and then your terminal when it started is connected to that standard in. And the, standard in, uh, the terminal's standard out output is connected now to your screen. So in this case, the terminal is an independent thing, is an independent piece of software. You could call it a demo, but it's not really a demo. It's an independent piece of software. It's a process that basically has standard in linked to your keyboard and standard out linked to your screen. Now this terminal has to have a, a program running on it for which you can be able to type in commands to. So at this point in time, this terminal just has standard in and standard out. It doesn't have anything else. You could tell it, run date or run whatever it is, or run X. For example, that's another example of running X on a terminal, on top of a terminal. So in that particular play, in the particular case, the standard in for X is, the standard in for the terminal is wired up to know the X process, and, and so forth. However, sometimes you want to run actual commands on a terminal. That's where it starts a shell for you. So a shell is a, piece of, is a program that allows you to type in commands. Uh, it interprets commands, it interprets the shell, shellisms, all these things to allow you to basically run commands against the system itself. And that's like the, bas the basic application for terminals. But you can put in other stuff on top of that. You can put in X, you can put in pretty much anything you want. You could just run one particular software and you're done. I think, if I'm just thinking, embedded devices do pretty much cheeky things like that. Just run one particular software from init. Yes. Pretty much, essentially, on a protocol level, all the OpenSH server does is start a terminal and then ask a shell to be started on that terminal and then wire in that terminal to your remote end. So if I'm here as a client, all I'm doing is, the, the, on the client side, is I have like a down screen. The terminal is actually on the server side, sending data over SSH to my screen. So that's essentially what it does. So imagine doing the same thing locally, but now extending it over SSH. Yeah, that's essentially what OpenSSH shells do. And that's the summary of what I want to show you here. So let me show you some examples of this code. So here we have a server implementation. Uh, right now I've wired it in to accept test user. <laughs> this is what I mean by saying the callback is important. You can do whatever you want. This is the stupidest implementation of a password check uh, you could possibly add. It just checks for a user called test user and a password called hello. Yes. There's actually a flag on this config that says don't even authenticate anyone, if that is what you want. It's possible to apply it for specific cases. For example, there's a guy who did the Tron thing. All he has to do is rate limit connections. He doesn't have to authenticate anyone. So, so long as you're searching to a server. So recap, we are talking about uh, implementing SSH clients and servers using the Golang's uh, crypto SSH library, which basically allows you to basically use SSH in whatever version you want. We've been discussing how OpenSSH is the current thing everyone pretty much knows about and has interacted with. The only you type in SSH and it does stuff. The protocol is actually malleable. You could do whatever you want with it. So in this case, we're talking about how you could use the Golang library to do those things. You can implement anything you want. You don't have to implement OpenSSH. You can implement, this was talking about someone who implemented Tron, Tron the game over SSH. So you can use your local SSH client, log into a server that gives you a Tron, Tron game and you play. 
So correction, SH connection. So a tunnel, SH tunnel is when you tunnel traffic from somewhere else to go through SSH to go somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, okay, I get what you mean. Yeah, I get what you mean. Just to be clear. Yeah. So let me show you, uh, I'll show you how I'll log in with this test user. I'll show you how to log in with a fake uh, key I have here that I, I decided that that would be the only key that would be authenticated here. And then I'll talk about the implementation of the server. And then we'll talk about now the terminal things. So let me run this quickly and hope the demo guards didn't change my implementation on me without me knowing. So here we have the server running. I'm logging a few things, but I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm not really sure if, if, if they'll be helpful for this particular session. So let's go to SSH server. A demo SSH server. So first, I am going to try to log in. So this, this server is limited in port 2022. So that's the first thing I'll do. I'm using the OpenSSH client to log into a server I've written. Test user, test user, at localhost, localhost. Wow, oh, cause I have the agent on, jeez. <laughs> let, me, let me do this. How do you remove stuff from the SSH agent? I just add minus, eh? Is it add minus what? Minus T. Oh, have to add, like this. And then the key. I just want to move, okay, let me see. It's T. D. Ah, it's D. Actually, let's just delete all the identities. Yeah, let's just delete all the identities. Yeah, that's fine. So, if I try this again, yes. <laughs> it will ask me for my password. So right now it's asking me for the password for test user at this server I've written. And the password is hello. And we have a terminal on that. Now, unfortunately because this was started inside my user, we've gone back into my user after it's done. Started a terminal for my user, for my specific environment. If I ran this on another user, or configured it to basically start a terminal for a different user, that's why you'll end up. But for simplicity, it's a bit more difficult. For simplicity purposes, I'm just going back to where I am. The important thing to know is, if, you, if, you, if I went up, you'll notice uh, the previous command isn't here. We're in a different shell entirely. If I exited out, see? This is pretty cool, by the way. The fact that I got the terminal working blew my mind. Now, next up, key. Da, da, da. This is a server I've written, by the way, behaving like an open SSH server. Very, very cool. Uh, now, I'll talk about, <laughs> we've already seen a shell started here. Let's run a command. Now, this way I, I, I cross my fingers, because some of this stuff is a bit janky. Hmm. Commands run. Let's run a crazier command. Let's run a command that requires a terminal. <laughs> I was uncertain of that working. Why is it worked? No, it's actually quite crazier than that. I'll show you in a moment. So we can see if it, it comes in a different one. How many times do I have here? How many times do I have? Oh, crap. How many times do I have? I hope I can still do it from here. Do I have X down? No, I don't have X down. I probably need X down. Let me just get X down so we can play around with that. Uh-huh. There's another environment variable. I have a feeling we might crap out on that, but let's see. What did it start? External. <laughs> Very cool. I did not know that would work. <laughs> I did not know that would work. So that's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, let me change the shell. Ah, but that has to happen on the server side. So let's do this. Let's, by the way, I'm just logging channels and the requests in case anyone is interested in seeing that. 
Uh, let me actually do something more, much more cooler and show you that my implementation is able to handle window changes. See all these guys? Yeah. This is all the Golang library. This, is, this isn't the, I'm not masquerading the OpenSearch server here. It's just with the library. So it's pretty powerful. Now, I don't know if this is crazy, if this is crazy to try, but let's see. Uh, let's see what happens. I actually don't know if this will work. So the shell is decided by the server. The terminal is decided by the client. It's a weird arrangement for OpenSSH. You could do whatever you want if you are implementing this. Uh, I think for now we'll just stick to that shell <laughs> and see what, uh, what happens. So I've demonstrated to you those particular things with the Golang library, doing those things with SSH. Other things you could play around with. Uh, I wanted to have tunnels for this particular demo and then I felt they got a bit out of hand because tunnel codes is interesting. It's a, ma it's a matter of, at some point you can go a bit crazy because it's a matter of redirect this guy to this guy and that, that guy to that guy and that guy and it had required error handling, otherwise I would not be able to do it well. I've done it for, for the project I'm working on, but I thought it would not, make, not be important for this particular talk, but I can show you after, it, after we're done here. I can show you examples of that. X11 forwarding, if you are mad, <laughs> you can try that as well, and you can do pretty much anything you want, so long as you talk a protocol both sides understand. So this, let me show you an example of, a, of how crazy you can get this. One of the implementations here, the last one, gravitational stellport, wired up web sockets to SSH, which allowed guys to basically type stuff on the web browser, which is basically think what basically Google is doing with their cloud logins. It's pretty much just wiring up that particular interface to an SSH connection, and you, you, you can do whatever you want. So you could do pretty interesting stuff with, this, with these things. Uh, if you don't like TLS or HTTPS, you could just do all your traffic over SSH if you wanted. So some examples of this, I'll show you this uh, after the talk because I actually don't have them set up, but we can, like, I'll show you where they are to get. Someone implemented chat with SSH, Tron with SSH. Gitte and Gogs use this library for the SSH, Git cloning and Git pushing, they use this library. As Jason has happily pointed out, Vault, Hashikov Vault, has an SSH engine. It uses this library. And finally, gravitational teleport. Teleport, what it does is it's an access gateway. So you add users, and they get to be able to use uh, the gateway to access uh, servers connected to teleport. And so it allows this nice way of managing security for your servers. I, I was very enthusiastic about using it last year. I remember discussing it at length with Jason. Unfortunately, I found a few problems. First, the servers have to be able to talk to Teleport and teleport has to be able to talk to the servers. And so if you have servers behind firewalls in places with no public IPs, you are screwed. So teleport can't help you with that. They have mechanisms called um, across data center uh, tunnels, but they only work if you can talk to the other side and the other side can talk to you. And so that's where the next idea came in. Iron Fist. I'm, I'm building a system. I'd call it, I'm calling it very many names. Last year I was calling it Karao. <laughs> And I decided Karao was a silly name for a system. And so now I've moved Iron Fist. So what this is, it's pretty much an access gateway. Much less silly, yes. <laughs> I saw it depends on who's asking at this point. I thought it was cool at some point. Um, it's an access gateway. What happens is you have your guys authenticate via some traditional means, LDAP, Google Auth, whatever it is. You have your users come into your onboarding is very simple. You just onboard guys on your current specific authorization identity server. There they get to add their keys, their public keys, and then they can request for access for various nodes. So nodes would connect to this uh, particular access gateway, even if they are in whatever weird environment they are. So in my environment, current environment at work, we sometimes host in environments that have no public IPs, but we still have to operate them. So what we end up doing is tunneling back to specific servers or bastions on our side. And so we mediate, we basically use, we tunnel SSH ports to a bastion somewhere and SSH through that to get to the machine itself. So instead of having this uh, kind of Rube Goldberg device going on, we want to formalize it into a system. 
And so the nodes would connect. Even if there's downtime, they would be able to retry and so forth. That's something we've had a hard time doing because we've had to set up interesting scripts to basically retry whenever connections went down to the remote nodes. No, 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 it's simple. They essentially just port forward the SSH uh, ports to a bus queue and we, we control. And then guys, SH, the, the SSH target now becomes that particular forwarded port. Does that make sense? We have a port on the remote node that's running SSH. We use an SSH client to port forward this port to a bus queue and we control. And then have guys target this new forwarded port as the SSH port for that server. Does that make sense? We're essentially like bringing forward the, the, the SSH of that machine to another port somewhere else and SSHing through that. And that has worked for us for some time, but as the team grows, it becomes very complicated. We had a long discussions last year. Um, we had the Vault discussion where we talked about using Vault for configuring keys for mini servers. And, and Ansible has specific ways to do that. But at some point it gets a bit junky. You, you also have to mediate the entire process. And sometimes human processes are not necessarily perfect. You always have hanging, like someone left the company, the keys hanging around somewhere. That's a big problem. So you want to be able to formalize that. And so guys request for access. And during the period of that access, a specific public and private key combination is configured for that specific node or nodes. And so when they switch with their public key, what essentially the, the, the gateway does is it MITMs the connection terminates the current SSH connection and connects it to a new SSH connection towards the node. And what that allows you to do is log everything that's happening, which is another requirement. Basically, have an idea what people are doing in servers because things would go down over a weekend and nobody would fess up to what happened. And that would be a big problem. Exactly, yes. It's actually a thought. Um, currently, I'm not, I'm not certain I've actually got it to the point where I can say this is something that you should actually throw to public internet. So what you're thinking is probably uh, hide it in some internal network because I don't think, I'm not qualified enough to be that good at security. So. <laughs> um, for guys who want to learn more, there's a very nice documents uh, page for this. Uh, the code is very readable. I can attest to that. And the crypto lib that implements SSH. Yes. So the go, the go guys, the guys who wrote, the, the, it, it, at this point, it's the SSH guys who called it that, the, the, the go guys who decided that. Again, I remember I kept telling you guys, so remember that X? That was meant to be experimental in 2012. <laughs> it is no longer experimental at this point. This is fully fledged working software right now. So let me, let me just say, this library, the, the slash SSH library, implements the protocol for SSH. So once you have the protocol in place with specific uh, language-based um, hooks, so for example, you have channels to manage channels, SSH channels, you're you getting. You don't, you don't want, yeah, you don't want to do stuff from the, the TCP level because your chances are you're going to get something wrong, especially with security level libraries. So instead, what you let you let happen is guys write in the libraries that do the work for you, and then you just hook in into the libraries. And I think pretty much every la big li big language, grown-up language, has a library for SSH. I saw one for Ruby, and I was very shocked. But I expect that's how Git, 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 GitHub is working. So then, if you if you really don't like messing with the low-level stuff, very brilliant guys made um, Glider, Lab, Glider Labs is a company. But one of the guys who work there is Program. If anyone knows Program, why doesn't make that name anywhere on the net? They wrote this thing. They wrote SSH and SSH abstraction higher than the current one that the library has. 
And the guys who wrote the library were like, this is a really good abstraction because it makes, if you've ever used HTTP handle, they've condensed all that SSH stuff into something that looks like SSH handle. And so it makes for, if you're experimenting or writing really, really simple servers and clients, just go ahead and play with that particular library. It's super simple. Um, and then if you really, really, really want into the, get into the weeds, read the RFCs. They are pretty entertaining. Um, before I do that, I remember someone asking me how, 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 how clients were set up. Let me see if I can open one up. Ah. So here, I'll show you the client side. I'll show you how the terminal was set up on the client side. So it get us uh, an idea of how this code looks like. Remember I said we're just wiring up standard in and started out to things. So the first thing you do is to get the, the pipes that allow you to connect to that on the channel. Then you now configure the terminal. Remember I said making a terminal is kind of an interesting beast. Terminals come from the world of teletypes and they were serial devices. So their abstractions also behave like serial devices. So you have to configure interesting things like what is the baud rate, <laughs> whether you want to echo or not. Very interesting things. Um, and then after you're done, and some of this stuff, you see this function here, get size, is actually a syscall. That's how, yes, that's how into the weeds this terminal stuff gets. These things haven't actually handled on this. These things that could break. I don't remember what specific terminal features I didn't implement. But anything that required specific tunings of terminals, I have a feeling I'm broken. So right now all I'm doing is opening a really simple terminal. I can't do a lot more with it. But once I open it, uh, once I open it, I get, I get the terminal back. I request for a terminal, I get the shell on the other side. Then locally here, what I do is I reset my current terminal. Now as a tangent, terminals are configured in two modes, something called cooked and raw or the official version is canonical and non-canonical. What that means is traditional teletypes allowed some kind of extra processing before data went to where that data went. Remember the old days screens didn't connect to a machine and they connected to some device somewhere else. And so what would happen is they added some extra processing to make using that particular terminal easier. So for example, if you backspaced, there would be no need to, for you to see the backspace character on the screen. The, the screen would actually just remove the character. And so it would buffer this particular interaction and then send out the final result after a carriage return. And so things like um, control C, enter, backspace, delete, control A, control E, all those things work against this particular high layer to allow you to basically use a terminal with ease. If you used your terminal in raw mode, you'd be typing every single control character. You'd be like, if I want to go to the, to the next character there, I have to do slash something. One of those ASCII specific uh, configurations where right, the right arrow is a control character. You have to type that in. And that basically in your head, you have to remember, you have to keep stating in your head knowing I've moved to the next character and you continue typing. So making it row here was actually me doing that to my current terminal. So that when I wire in that terminal and mine, there is no, there's no mix up on who's on which mode. We are all on row modes. So that now that terminal takes over mine and decides how it wants to run mine. If I didn't do that, I should have shown you this before I did that. If you didn't do that, things like Control-C, things like Backspace would get very weird effects. Vim and Htop wouldn't work because Vim and Htop require row mode. Um, other interesting things, like if you ran top, top would essentially just block your terminal because traffic would basically come down to the last end and not be able to Control-C and tweet out. It was interesting. And so after we're done, all I do now is set up a, a specific cycle listening for the signal change. So terminal size windows, when they change, they change based on a signal. So if you change this window size, a signal is actually launched to the processes that are currently running in that, in that particular terminal. And so if you're listening for that signal, you can know if the window changed or not. And so I listen for that and send it across the wire so that we can update the, 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 the particular terminal. And at the end of the day, I just wire in, copy out, send it out, send it in, and we're done. We have a terminal in place. Same thing happens on the server side. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens on the server side. It's pretty much, it looks almost exactly the same, except for the fact, fact that I have to handle all these channels. So for example, remember I said you have to handle a session type? 
if, if a, if a ch session channel came in, uh, if a non-session channel came in, I would reject it. But a normal one, I'd handle it. And handling it means having to deal with every one of these requests. I've actually written them here. The first thing that happens on a typical shell request is you will get a TTY request. Then get an environment. This is optional. You could get environment requests, like seed these environments in that. And then finally get a shell request. And then you have a terminal that's working. And then after that, all you get are window changes. And then there's something I broke. Remember I said there are some things I didn't finish doing? You need an exit status signal to the client. You need to tell the client I'm done. And I did not do that because the marshalling for that is very interesting. But once you do that, you essentially have a protocol that can work with an open SSH client. Uh, and then if you're running commands that use TTY, it looks like that, the sequence of requests that come in. You're just running a command is just one, one request. And so in this loop, I attempt to do all that. It's just one loop. And they essentially just play around with that. For example, once a TTY comes in, all I do is start a TTY and after I'm done, I return. I exit out of that loop. Um, if it's an end request, all I do is I seed the command before it started. I seed the command with this new environment. If it's a PTY request, I seed this command with what type of terminal I want. And if it's just a runner command, I have to check. Did we get a previous TTY request? If it is, it means you have to start a TTY. If we don't, we just run the command and we are done. And that's basically what that code does. And so as, this is what I want to say. This is, this is 179 lines. Fully fledged open the search compatible server or at least parts of OpenSSH server <laughs> yeah. in just 179 lines. That's pretty dope without error handling. <laughs> without error handling. Yeah. And with that, I thank you for coming. I am done. Do you have extra questions so that I don't close the session uh, prematurely? How would you test the code? Now, that's an interesting question. I've been asking myself that question for days. So one thing I, I think, I think this one, I'm, I'm actually not sure what the right answer is to this, but personally in what I've been building with Golan, I felt, first of all, the static typing holds, like it protects you from a bunch of really, very really nasty stuff. Our main jungle backend we have very strict rules for testing. 100% coverage, someone has to double check the tests as you're doing the reviews and so forth. And that, is, that basically prevents bad things from entering into the code base. But for something like Go, there are some things you can catch from the get-go, using the wrong types for specific things, uh, calling the wrong function. In Python, you can't do that. Python, wrong things will happen in runtime that you should have fixed a bunch of uh, development cycles ago. In Go, you're protected, number one, with the static typing. Number two is I, have, I feel when it comes to something like Go and you're building infrastructure-based things, unit tests are kind of limiting. They don't actually prove things work. So I find in Go, big integration tests actually prove a lot of things to you, especially if you're testing the happy path and some error cases, prove a bunch of safety things for you. I've had software that I wrote very simple integration tests for has been running for two years, and the biggest failure it had is me forgetting to update the certificates. Those are the biggest failures. Oh, there's a second one where it has a memory leak somewhere and I can't find it. But that's, 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 that's something else, that's, a, that's beyond, you couldn't test for that and find it easily. But that's, that's essentially what... The one I was talking, no, this one, the one I was talking about the last, last year. The, the one where I took the same amount of time as I'm taking today. <laughs> uh, we have a data transport layer to avoid issues where we have to figure out if connections are up, if they're inter intermittent, if the bandwidth goes up and down. We don't want to be doing that over HTTP. So instead we have a pipe system in place to transport data all over the place. It was written in Golan and it's, it's been pretty stable so far, transporting ridiculous amounts of data. Yeah. I have lost my thread. <laughs> we were talking about, oh, testing. So I find, I find integration tests, so long as you've covered your bases, give you a good runway to production readiness. And then you have production readiness checks that are pretty straightforward. Do you have timeouts? Are you logging errors? Yeah. 
Now, I have two answers for that. For Iron Fist, I've been doing some interesting stuff. At the interface layers between the SSH code and the other backend code where that is doing things like password checks, public key checks, adding users and so forth, there is an interface layer. I can essentially plug in an interface to where I want things, and then what I do is I can test the SSH layer in isolation without the backend itself. And so what that allows me to do is like bring up, because Go is so good at Go routines, just run the server in a Go routine and run commands against SSH into it, find out if that particular SSH session fails, do something else. And that's pretty, pretty sweet. But that allows me to test the SSH layer in isolation. And then when I come to the backend, I don't have to care about the SSH layer anymore. I just test the backend in isolation. That gives me some guarantee that some things are safe. I, I don't know, but I'm speculative on that. <laughs> Oh, it starts its own session on the side. Yeah. I would not be surprised if Tmax is doing the same terminal, uh, what's it called, uh, bringing up a terminal stuff that is, SSH is doing. It's, it's, it's the same, same stuff. If you're dealing with terminals, if you're dealing with TTYs, PTYs, that stuff is going to, to find you. It's a serial device that you have to mess with. It's, it's Vim also does the same thing with it to do, to do what it's doing. So, yeah, Vim has to basically come up, build up its own, like reset the terminal and set specific configurations for that terminal to use it. Otherwise, you'd not be able to do the normal mode and so forth. You'd not be able to draw on the terminal. Yeah, so terminals are interesting beasts. Any questions? And with that, then I close the session. Thank you.